Welcome to the History Guy podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy is going to talk about television. First, he'll tell the story of television's invention, from its earliest antecedents to the modern world. Then, he'll tell the story of a particularly interesting part of television history, the early regional TV network called Don Lee Broadcasting. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Just the other day I got an email from YouTube with my channel's year in review, and among other things it told me that in 2019 viewers spent 6.1 million hours watching The History Guy. And that's amazing to me, because The History Guy is not that big a channel by YouTube standards, but this really just started as something I was doing in my basement, because I really love to tell stories of history, and it touches me that so many of you share that passion, and that you spend your time watching The History Guy, and I really do thank you. But it got me to thinking about how easily we pick the television that we watch these days, because I'm old enough to remember when you only got three stations that came into your house through an antenna up on the roof. The technology of television has developed dramatically just in my lifetime, not even counting all the things that took it up to that point. And the development of that that world-changing technology required the convergence of dozens of different kinds of technology and dozens of inventors, some of them famous and some of them relatively forgotten. And it is certainly history that deserves to be remembered. The idea of television, electronic transmission of moving pictures, goes back to the earliest form of electronic communication, the telegraph, which began connecting the world in 1837. As telegraph wires started crossing nations and then oceans, people almost immediately started working on advancements. The ability to transmit spoken voice rather than just dots and dashes, the ability to transmit without wires, and surprisingly early, the ability to transmit pictures. In 1860, Italian priest Giovanni Caselli invented the pentelegraph. The device would transmit across normal telegraph lines. Devices at both ends would be synchronized with a pendulum. The message would be written with insulating ink on a metal plate. The synchronized receiving apparatus would use a piece of paper impregnated with a chemical that darkened when a current passed through it. The sender would send the image as current, and the receiver would decode it. The device, an early facsimile machine, could reproduce an image. The image would be written a line at a time as the pendulum swung, and the lines together would show the image. This process was an early version of what is called rasterization, stacking lines to make an image called a raster image, named for the Latin word for rake, would be a critical part of the development of television. It was mostly used to check signatures for banking, but developed the idea that images could be transmitted by electronic current alone. The device was relatively slow and essentially only useful for lines, not shades, but astoundingly it was patented and in commercial use more than a decade ahead of the invention of the telephone. The pentelegraph actually worked on the same principles of modern television. A picture would be encoded into an electronic signal, which would somehow be transmitted to a receiver who could decode that signal and reconstruct the image. But quite a lot would have to be done before that could show you, say, a moving picture. One problem was that the device could only write one line at a time. Translating moving images would require an ability to draw all the lines at once, or at least nearly at once. The first solution to that problem came from German inventor Paul Julius Gottlieb Nipkow. His solution, the Nipkow disk, patented in 1885, uses a revolving disk perforated with holes in a spiral. Each hole represents a spot that could encode data. As the disk spins, each hole encodes data across a single line. The decoding machine would use a synchronized disk, which would then stack the lines. Because the perforations are in a spiral, each line is rendered at a different time, allowing the data being coded a line at a time, but because the disk spins to the eye, the picture seems to be moving together. 
but turning the NIPCOT disk into a method to broadcast live pictures required other technological developments, notably the light-sensitive phototube developed in the 1870s and the Audion vacuum tube invented by American Lee DeForest and patented in 1907, which amplified signals and was key to both broadcast radio and television. In 1925, Scotsman John Baird demonstrated the first working television. The system used a subject, he actually used dummy heads in his first model since they had clearer contrast than regular human faces, in a darkened room. A bright light was shown on them which was reflected through a Nipkow disk. The light would be captured by phototubes which would encode the light into electrical signals for brightness and darkness. That would be sent via radio to a receiver. On the receiver, the signals would be read and flashed on a bright lamp through a synchronized Nipkow disk. As the disk spun, the light through the holes in the disk would appear as lines and create a raster image. The quality of the picture depended upon the number of lines that could be encoded and the speed of the disk. As larger disks beyond a certain diameter became impractical, the picture quality of mechanical television, so called because the light was coded via the spinning disk, was limited. But the combination of photo tubes, more powerful radio transmission, and the Nipkow disk allowed the development of early television in many nations. Purportedly, the world's first experimental television station, W2XB, began broadcasting in 1928 from the General Electric Corporation facility in Schenectady, New York. And that station still operates today. Mechanical television was the primary kind of television that was used for programming in the 1930s, but its obvious limitations, it tended to create a fairly blurry picture that was fairly small, sometimes only a couple inches across, simply failed to capture the public's attention. And Of course, the period of the Great Depression was not exactly fertile ground to develop a new, expensive, luxury consumer item. But a quantum leap in television technology was already being developed. In 1897, German physicist Carl Ferdinand Braun built the first cathode ray tube. The CRT is a vacuum tube where electrons are generated and projected onto a phosphorescent screen. The phosphor on the screen glows when struck by the electrons. The stream of electrons is focused into a tight beam and magnets are used to manipulate the beam. It was quickly recognized that the CRT had the potential to operate both as an image transmitter and a receiver, but early experiments with what would be called electronic as opposed to mechanical television were disappointing. While there were many competing systems and developments, the first all-electric television system was demonstrated by American inventor Philo Farnsworth in 1927. Born in 1906, Farnsworth was said to have had the idea for his electronic television when he was just 14 and realized that only electrons were fast enough to capture and represent a clear moving picture. Farnsworth's contribution was the use of a CRT to both scan and receive images. His system was first demonstrated in 1928 and is widely recognized as the first demonstration of an electronic television system. Farnsworth received numerous patents for devices regarding the development of television as well as other pursuits and is widely regarded as the inventor of electronic television. However, multiple inventors in the U.S. and Europe were working on similar ideas. The Radio Corporation of America employed Russian-born inventor Vladimir Zworkin, who had applied for a patent for electronic television in 1923 but had not successfully built a working device. RCA sued Farnsworth over patent priority, but Farnsworth eventually won the dispute. RCA agreed to pay Farnsworth for the use of his patents, and it was a combination of Farnsworth's and Zworkin's contributions as well as developments in Europe that steadily improved the quality of electronic television recording and transmission. Experimental stations were created in both the United States and Europe, and a handful of events were broadcast. RCA hoped to drive the growth of television by using mass production techniques to reduce the cost of the TVs and by increasing programming through its NBC network. But the restrictions of the technology, the high cost, and the limitations of the Great Depression still kept the technology from really taking off. And then when the Second World War came along, most of those resources were turned to wartime technologies like radio and radar. For example, in April of 1942, the United States stopped the production of all civilian broadcasting equipment and shifted all that material to wartime use. At the time, there were only an estimated 5,000 television sets in all the United States. But the end of the war created fertile ground for the growth of the new technology. In October 1945, the U.S. War Production Board ended its wartime ban on the production of radio and television equipment for consumer use. Wartime production had grown the U.S. economy substantially, and the U.S. enjoyed post-war prosperity. By 1947, there were about 44,000 TVs in the United States. By 1949, there were 940,000. By 1953, there were 20 million. Gosh. 
television offered reasonably priced entertainment and networks, stations, and programs proliferated. As programming was supported by advertising, it was both affordable and it drove the consumer culture that encouraged buying consumer items like televisions. By 1960, three quarters of American families owned at least one television. There were important technological developments of this period, notably in 1947 the development of the intercarrier sound system which allowed the processing of the sound and the picture together and eliminated the need to have separate transmitters and receivers for audio and video. Color television offered its own set of problems. The United States had two competing systems and was seeking a standard. The initial version selected by the FCC in 1950 would have used the UHF spectrum and the signals were incompatible with existing black and white sets. This, unsurprisingly, limited the audience as there was little color programming being produced, and what there was could only be viewed on the limited number of color televisions. An integrated system with compatible color, where the signal was sent along with the black and white image, was created and accepted as standard by the FCC in 1953. Although the color could only be seen on color receivers, both black and white and color televisions could receive the same programs. Still, high cost and limited programming limited the appeal of color sets, and color televisions did not start outselling black and white televisions until the 1970s. One issue with CRT television is that the tube requires distance for the electron guns to project. Initial designs for flat screens that rendered the signal differently were proposed as early as the 1960s, but were not commercially available until the 1980s. Displays were first used in devices like video recorders, where the portability of the screen was most important, but over time were developed into highly capable and large television sets. Because they did not require the depth of a CRT, screens could now be built into telephones or hung on walls. In a liquid crystal display TV, the TV has a bright backlight and tiny liquid crystals are rotated in front of the light. Using polarized filters, the crystals control the color and intensity of the light they let through, building a picture made of pixels. Newer LED TVs work using essentially the same method, but are backlit using light-emitting diodes. Perhaps the largest transformation in television broadcasting in recent years has been the advent of digital television. With analog TV following frequency guidelines set way back in the 1940s, a station sends a signal along a radio frequency. The programming is coded into the signal via variance in amplitude. Digital television instead converts the signal into binary bits. Digital signals are higher quality and they are more accurately represent the picture and do not degrade over distance. Digital is also more efficient, requiring less bandwidth to send the signal. Digital television was not made practical until the 1990s, when digital compression technology was developed to radically decrease the bandwidth from that which was needed for uncompressed digital video. Compressed digital television has made high-definition television, with much higher levels of resolution than previously available, practical. The decreased bandwidth required prompted a worldwide effort to move broadcast television to digital, allowing greater use of the airwaves. The problem is that existing broadcast televisions, a disproportionate number of which are still held by people with lesser financial means, cannot read a digital signal and require either the addition of a digital-to-analog converter box or a new television. The digital conversion would seem to affect a small population in the United States, as estimates are that only about 10% of the population relied on broadcast or antenna-based television in 2014. Still, the U.S. is not expecting to complete the digital transition and shut off all analog television broadcasting until 2021. Originally, television was mostly broadcast, that is, sent over radio frequencies. This limited the number of channels that could be offered and required the regulation of television frequencies. The sending of signals via wire was actually first a solution for smaller communities that didn't have local broadcasting and had difficulty receiving broadcast or terrestrial television signals because of terrain. Pay cable service was available in the United States in the 1950s, but cable's growth was limited as broadcast television was supported by advertising and thus free. Moreover, the networks opposed cable as a competitor and convinced the FCC to intervene and create regulations that required cable to carry local programming and kept cable out of urban markets where it would compete with broadcast TV. In 1972, the rules were loosened to allow cable to carry distant programming and Time Incorporated created a network on the U.S. East Coast called Home Box Office that offered movies and special event programming on a pay-per-view basis. When the FCC allowed television signals to be transmitted via satellite in 1975, HBO took advantage of the ruling. Local cable operators could get programming via satellite from dish antennas and distribute to customers via cables. A federal district court decision in 1977 ruled that the FCC did not have authority to regulate cable TV to protect the networks, 
and many barriers dropped. Further deregulation occurred under the Reagan administration in the 1980s, and by 1985, cable had more than 40 million subscribers in the United States. Cable TV subscription peaked in the year 2000 at about 68 million subscribers, but now faces competition from satellite and telephone service providers, and the amount of cable subscribers is in the decline. The development of the television is strikingly dynamic. There are at least a dozen inventors that can make a fair claim to be called the inventor of television. And new television technologies have changed so quickly that they often barely even resemble the technology from just a few years previous. And if you ever in your life shelled out a lot of money for a projection screen TV, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Today, the line between television and computers has really blurred, as you can now watch television over internet protocols, as smart TVs can access the internet, and as television content can be stored on a server and then played on demand. And that has reduced the demand for some traditional television technologies. For example, the number of people who subscribe to cable has steadily declined since the year 2000. And the, the ability to watch television on your smartphone or on your tablet has actually reduced the need for televisions in the United States, which went from an average of 2.6 per household in 2009 to 2.3 per household in 2015. Meanwhile, the market research group Nielsen says that in 2018, the average American spent 11 hours a day interacting with the media, down from nine and a half hours just four years previously in 2014, as television time and computer time and uh, social media time have all kind of melded together to be this thing that we call screen time. One surprising effect of all this ability to choose your television is that it's brought back a venerable technology, and that is many cable cutters are now again putting antennas up on their roof so they can access basic television for free. And according to that same Nielsen survey between 2014 and 2018, the percentage of Americans who rely upon an antenna for their television increased from about 10% to about 14%. Television content continues to powerfully impact culture, but now you have so many channels and so many choices that even a small voice like the history guy can touch an audience, and that has reduced the relative power of the once dominant networks, and it raises thorny questions about, say, the psychological impact of all that screen time or what to do about dangerous content, and those questions will continue to vex us as this dynamic technology continues to develop into the future. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy, a little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. Television, that thing we use to watch streaming services these days. Uh, some of the earliest precursors to television that you mentioned here in this episode, like the Pantelegraph or the mm -hmm. Nipkow disc, are really, really interesting. But I think to, to people who you know have modern televisions, they're actually yeah, kind of well, mechanical television. Like, the Pantelegraph was really like a fax machine, but uh, but it, it raster yeah. images. But uh, you know, it's hard. I mean, so much of the generations now don't even know what it's like not to have digital television. Uh, you know, not to have flat screens and etc. Yeah. I, I remember black and white TVs, but uh, where you could very clearly see the lines uh, and uh, early video games where you could really tell. The those lines were there too but uh, yeah. the, the the whole idea of mechanical television as opposed to electronic television it's really just kind of mind-bending uh and it's it's kind of cool what they were able to do but when you understand how a nipkow disc works then you understand that the limitation in terms of the number of lines and therefore the the quality of the image is the size of the disc and they got so they had so like these <laughs> seven foot you know discs that they were spinning to try to get more lines in but clearly yeah they, i mean it was something. clearly they were rich the camera was going to tip over it was wobbling from the spinning of the disc and so i mean it's amazing uh, what what you could do with that and uh, but it i mean it's all the whole story and the story really in both the episodes today is really fascinating because you've got you know this technology is is very expensive to figure out and you don't really know what the potential is and you know you don't want to there's there's no good with the technology if you don't have programming but there's no good with the program if you don't have technology the two have to pay for each other and how do you how do you come up with the idea of building tv because until you build it no one's going to watch it and so it, yeah, it was, it's, it all yeah. makes for an interesting story. Uh, a thing to say about it, though, is that this is this was clearly a ripe technology. Uh, there's there were a lot of things that were coming together at the same time. So whenever you try to talk about, say, who's responsible for this or that, or you know, a lot of arguments about Lee Forest or whatever, and, and you know, what was Dworkin's role versus what was Farnsworth's role, uh, that it's another one of these pieces of technology where you can you can have arguments all the day over who's the real father, who really invented it, because so many were coming together at the same yeah. time, and it really is it's something that you know it was just ready ready to come when it came. So. In, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, some of the early programmers like the Don Lee system were more pioneers than some of the technological guys who really built it because there were other yeah. people that were moving that direction. 
Yeah, it's an interesting, because it does really feel like that when you tell the story that it was so many mm -hmm. different technologies mm -hmm. coming together and so many different people who are working toward, I mean, ultimately the same the same thing, if, you know, from slightly different angles and such. But it, it's also interesting to me how, you know, the idea with these lines that they used with the mechanical television it ends up being, in concept, not that not that different from the first, you know, the first uh, Captain oh, yeah, Ray yeah, yeah. There was, and stuff yeah, like that. that the idea of a raster image went all the way up until we hit essentially yeah. digital television. And, and yeah, so, it's and you amazing. can see, I mean, you can still see that. I mean, we also worked on old computers when you could see there was never a straight line, you know, if, if it was, if it was an angle, yeah. it, you know, if it was, if it was horizontal, it was fine. Otherwise you could see the bumps in it. And yeah, it's, I, I, I mean, a raster image is kind of a cool idea. That's, that, that's how you could encode data. And that really made the, you know, the miracle that allowed it all to happen. But you can really see how that differs from reality in a way uh so so i mean yeah. some, like when you look at people you know it's digital <laughs> so it's better than digital but i mean they're not like built from lines yeah it is and it's it's really it, i mean it's just cool it's almost steampunky how those original systems worked mm -hmm. uh and and what they used to do it yeah. and uh, so i mean it's it's yeah, well, and you know, at the time, it was absolutely amazing. It was cutting edge technology. You know, people didn't believe yeah. it, and you can kind of see why when people looked at it and said, "Yeah, this isn't going to last." You know, people said, "Ah, oh, TV isn't going to last." I mean, there was you know, when you look at the early technology and the early programming, you can see why they thought, you know, who's going to want to live life other than that? And uh, you know, now you know, we all walk around with our face in a screen. Yeah, and now <laughs> we carry many TVs with us everywhere we go. I mean, who'd have guessed? Yeah. Yeah. On, on that note, it, it is really incredible how the television changed and transformed American life. And I mean, truly global yeah. life, too. But I mean, I think in America, we have a very particular television culture. For a lot. And you know, when, you, when you meet people who, when they were kids, did not watch television, it's, it's, a, it's a very different experience. Yeah. So I, 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 I mean, I grew up in front of television. I'm, I'm, when I think about it, when I, I mean, the other day, I was, I was doing something. I was like singing lyrics from theme songs from TV shows. Uh, and like, how do I, you know, how did you, how did I learn that? stuff i mean I, I really did grow up on television and i and i you know i don't watch very much today i know a lot of popular shows today but i mean i can remember i'm probably a hundred shows that i know in good detail that somewhere along the way i mean i watched that enough uh, and so yeah it changed your life I was thinking that too, is that there's, you know, there ends up being so many television shows that, that mean so much to us. And I mean, I've, it's been an important part of my life. I've been, although I was not watching it in the same way you were, a lot of the stuff I've watched was on Netflix, a uh, whole, whole series that way. But, you know, from sci-fi TV shows to one of my favorite sitcoms is Cheers. And I, so I was kind of, I wanted to ask you on a kind of a different note, you know, what are some of your favorite TV shows? It's hard. First of all, you know me. I'm I'm not good at favorites, and I don't watch a lot of TV today. If you ask me what are popular television shows today, I probably wouldn't know. Most everything I'm watching, I'm watching on demand. Uh, so, but I can say from the past. I mean, I tons and tons of shows. I I watched. Mom liked detective shows. Dad liked westerns. I've seen probably every episode of Gunsmoke. I've seen probably every episode of Bonanza. I can see to you both theme songs from Bonanza. There were two of them, uh, and uh, I watched. I think every episode of Mash. I watched first episodes when they were coming out. Original episodes of All in the Family. I mean, some of the best TV shows out there uh, and if I if I want to startle people when I went to grad school back in the previous century uh, my master's thesis in communication actually looked at popular television as a, as a cultural comparison so I actually recorded and then coded every episode of the Cosby show I, I uh, recorded and coded uh, the first like five seasons of Saturday Night Live uh, and I compared those to Faulty Towers and to Monty Python's Flying Circus to make cultural comparisons which is a lot of fun so I mean I've really dissected some of those shows so it's, it's hard for me to say favorites but I, I, I can say I see a lot of shows that come up uh, uh, today that I'm, I'm very nostalgic for the stuff that I grew up to see but I was I was like on the treadmill and I came upon the station that was playing TV from my era like Adam 12 and Emergency uh, and I'm like this is so much fun I used to watch this when I was growing up and then I realize that all the commercials are, are I've fallen and I can't get up uh, or I can't get it up and I need blue pills sent to me in the mail and I'm like wow that's that really says the generation that I'm that I'm on here and so if you want to ask me about uh, you know uh, any like old detective shows like Rockford Files or Mannix or Cannon or the streets of San Francisco or uh, I mean I, I I mean I saw Kojak I mean I saw all of those and uh, uh, McLeod uh, 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 Macmillan and wife the Snoop sisters I mean it's uh, it's crazy how many I know the Mod Squad and and I even remember when uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's first show was called Bad Cats Burglary Auto Detail it was actually a TV show about auto theft uh, and uh, so I, I it's hard for me to say favorites I can say that I grew up so much on television that it's a huge it's a huge part of who i am and it it, it really does date you from the shows that you watch well and it drives uh, and so much yeah. culture these days 
Yeah, yeah, and it, it does. I mean, much of how people understand America is because they've watched our television, and and but it's also amazing how much television we take from the UK. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want to, I mean, if you want to do another master's thesis, it would be interesting to compare, for example, the UK version of The Office to the American version of The Office because they're really very different shows on the same premise. So I I, I think uh, I mean what I what I was doing in my master's thesis is saying it is so pervasive. Uh, that it represents a good chunk of, not all of, I mean, but it represents a good chunk of, of the cultural understanding of a people. And so if you look at the most popular television shows at the time, then you'll get an idea of where the mindset of the people were. And that it's a really interesting way to look at it from a communication perspective. And it's, and I mean, it is so different now. I mean, I remember uh, it, in the, in the nineties uh, when they had a, they, we would watch friends every week and they, it was in some kind of Thursday night block that, what M NBC, I think, aired those had, uh, but I, I like, and I remember watching the the first season, the spinoff Joey, which was not not that good. But <laughs> I I didn't I didn't watch Joey, but for me that was after Mash. I actually watched after Mash when it was, which is famously bad, famously. <laughs> they, yeah. After after one of the most acclaimed television shows in history, after Mash was a famously bad uh, follow up. And uh, yeah, they had a they that's there are spinoffs of a number of shows that just ended up that were, did not work at all. Yeah. Didn't work out. Though an interesting was you know they did a, they did one called Trapper John M D. So Trapper was one of the characters yeah. on Mash, and then they did a modern medical drama with the idea that you know Trapper was the same character was uh, and it was actually played by uh, Parnell Roberts who had been on Bonanza. <laughs> but uh, so uh, so it was it was really not quite a spinoff, but it, I mean it, it used that same character, but it wasn't a comedy. It was a drama. And, I mean it's kind of interesting. Huh. So I mean there's there's a lot you could make whole channels. There are people who do make whole YouTube channels just on on yeah. the history of how these television shows work. But they really do say. Something how you know even you know plot lines from uh, daytime dramas and stuff like that those really say a lot. Uh, how much of our culture knows the meaning when you say who shot Jr. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, even and, I even I get right? that one. And that's, yeah, and that's, and that's so, a, so, a little before my time, but. But it, 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 so it seems trivial because we talk about, you know, we talk about all sorts of things uh, in history. But I mean, it seems trivial, but actually it's, it's some of the stuff that's most memorable to people and, and most salient to people and most represents kind of where their thinking is at a given time. And you can understand a lot of politics if yeah. you understand where popular television is. It's really quite incredible. I, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the some of the science behind, you know, those cathode ray televisions with the lines. One of the things mm -hmm. that that I found out uh, it wasn't that recently, but. If you've ever played the the old Nintendo Entertainment System, you play Duck Hunt with the uh, those little laser uh -huh. guns that they've got for that, and the the dog would pop up and snickle if you yeah, missed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those those are, you can't play those on a modern TV on a LCD or anything like that. They they rely on the technology of the cathode ray firing those lines, and so somehow uh, what they would have is they would have like essentially holes in the lines that would fly across the screen, and that was the duck, and so it could tell you whether you hit it or not based on where the on those cathode lines uh, so that was the only way that was the only way that you could even use it so it's a little interesting to me that that technology I mean it's I well I still have a, huh. I've got an old CRT TV specifically because I want to play duck hunts really for that <laughs> so I mean I, I don't play a lot of uh, you know uh, video games but I mean if you if you're putting modern video games and TV can't use uh, can't not use... that same kind of that light technology Shooter. that was actually uh, working huh. on those guns is that apparently it really relied huh. on the uh, on that specific kind of technology and that's interesting i didn't i didn't know that at all but uh, it won't work you can you know you can plug an nes into yeah, that a is, and TV, it's, it's but... interesting to see how that has has changed over yeah. time you know so it's something you know I, I i am plenty old enough that things that i were amazing and cutting edge are now you know classic and kind of kitschy and... yeah yeah the the uh the i think a lot of those those uh the nintendo zapper that's what they, that's what it was it was a zapper <laughs> yeah um, yeah, in the uh, on the like the arcade game, the quarters game, it actually looked like a gun. Yeah. But uh, but uh, the 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 Nintendo one. Yeah, it was. A, I don't know some sort of laser, something that was supposed to be, I think, less threatening in the yeah, home. Pretty, pretty sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it didn't. It didn't look. If you had that, it didn't look like what you'd be doing with it is shooting ducks. No, no that's, yeah, that's yeah. true. But I, I I was. I finally got my laser pointer, my laser pistol. Quack quack. Let's go, hunt, no, let's go let's hunt some ducks with. Go that. duck hunting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I, you know, along with the technology, I very strongly remember it was around, I think it was like 2009-ish that they were beginning this. They, they were switching to digital. 
uh, when, the, yeah. when we were moving away from the from the analogs. Yeah, and and actually in two thousand nine they switched any any large carrier any large power carriers switched in two thousand nine. Okay. Yeah, the the slow part, the part that came afterwards, that there were there were a number of small stations, small carrier stations had low low bandwidth and low power, uh, and those low power stations, some of them played on FM radio. You get them in different places. There were really niche audiences that that was the, the way that they were getting their television, and it was a whole different economic game for them because of the cost of switching to digital. When many of them that their bandwidth is going to be sold to radio anyway uh, and so they kept getting delays and delays and delays and I think at the time that I made this episode which is what in 2019 I think, so, yeah. I think maybe 2020 uh, that they were still delaying on some of those small uh, those carriers the, the ones that were using small uh, energy carriers uh, uh, small frequency carriers yeah. I guess I uh, saw one that, and that, that actually even that pushed out too and for some stations yeah in into Alaska. January of 2022 yeah. that was yeah that was Alaska and that was that was because it required uh, work on the antennas and there's only so much time of the year you can work on an antenna in Alaska. <laughs> Alaska. There's, there's only most of the months of the year it's deadly to try climb an antenna in Alaska and so the you know because of the weather so I think uh, so that was uh, January like 20th of this year I, I it looks like we did meet that deadline and that there should not be any other uh, analog uh, television that's being broadcast in the United States uh, and, and so we did finally but it's being transitioned slowly over the world yeah. so I mean that's much it's I think we're still you know even just like kind of in planning stages in parts of Africa and things yeah. like that. A lot of the trends that we talked about in that episode, though, I mean, like it was mentioning that more and more people had switched to an antenna and were cutting the cable uh, they're using because, you know, you got all these other ways to get your television now and you just use your, you know, your antenna to get your local news or something like that. That percentage has continued to grow. That's interesting. And really shocking when we saw, you know, what happened with the stocks with Netflix uh, to see that we might have started to saturate that streaming service market. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I think we've all and, got that feeling of, of yeah, it's what's, just what's like having come cable next? now. You got to, you got to spend all this money on these various. Yeah. Yeah, well, and services. you got like a bunch of them. Yeah, it used to be Netflix was the only one. Yeah. I don't know how many people realize that what Netflix actually started out is really competition for Blockbuster. <laughs> Where Netflix started is they would mail you DVDs in the mail, and they would have been killed by Redbox. Yeah. And now who uses a DVD? Uh, and and Netflix moved to streaming, and now and now streaming the streaming market they're facing so much competition yeah. that they might have saturated market. And it's it's really interesting. Uh, I'm not an investor or anything like that, but it will be interesting to see exactly where that goes and where the next technology is going to be. And of course, YouTube, oh, yeah. where I am, has has challenged how some of that works and there are different models that, that are going on you know all over the place. Yeah. I mean it certainly seems remiss to, to talk about TV and not mention a little bit that, that I would this this uh, your the YouTube show really represents kind of a change in mm -hmm. some of how that's how that's gone mm -hmm. down and this ability for anyone to with with yeah. I mean with relatively little investment. Yeah, it's it, you know what it is it's very much like the old uh, public access yeah. television. I mean, yeah. be, there was a bandwidth where you know any idiot in their basement that could come up with a camera could make a TV show, and you get you know you might only have a handful of viewers, but I mean it didn't cost you much to do it. Now you can reach out around the world and you can find your audiences. And if you look on YouTube, you find all sorts of funny funny little channel topics that have you know two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand subscribers because you can find your peeps uh, even you know even with a fair Fairly niche market, and I, we, you know, to an extent, that's where we are. But I mean, uh, history's a little bigger than some, and a lot smaller than others. Uh, and uh, and YouTube, one of the things about it is a lot of the the former traditional television is starting to intrude into our space. Yeah. They've realized that there's real money here, and now we're competing with you know people who have much bigger budgets than us uh, because they they're figuring out you can make as much money or more money on YouTube than you could put it out on broadcast. So it's it's really it's interesting how that all changes, how the technology changes. It's certainly you know when I was a kid and you had to watch what was on when it was on, and uh, they used the commercial breaks was the only time you couldn't pause it so you, you were happy that you had commercials right grass belt commercials now then you're happy because that's the only time you go to the bathroom or go get your tv dinner out of the oven uh and uh you know your your hungry man tv yeah. dinner and go put on your tv tray uh, and watch it and, and you know we thought that was cool i mean uh, you know i remember uh, when cable first came out we were one of the first people in my hometown that got hbo uh and uh, i remember Fancy. when we had black and white televisions i remember the back of the tv being off where people were replacing tubes and i remember all that changing over time time uh, and I mean, there was even this point kind of in the switchover where there was a there was a store, uh, an electronic store in New Jersey that was selling black and white TVs for 99 cents. Uh, yeah. And they were like, "Ooh, you can buy a TV for 99 cents. And, you know, within within a year, it wasn't worth 99 yeah, cents. Like... Black and white TVs weren't anymore. And yeah, so, I mean, it's it, how much it's changed now. It just makes me wonder, you know, what's that going to be like for you? What's it going to be like for your kids? It's, it's amazing uh, and, uh, how it's how it's changed, because uh, I mean, even, you know, mm -hmm. in my lifetime went from having I remember when my cousin got a 50 inch. Uh, it was a, one of the CRTs, and I mean, it was enormous. This thing was, I, uh -huh. I don't know how you, how they moved the thing, honestly. Uh, but it, and, and now, you know, now 
we have much larger TVs than that that are much much lighter. Although, uh, and well, cost yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. Even, My yeah. wife and I were yeah, talking those, about uh, the, those, the... those projection screen TVs were hysterical yeah. if you think about it because someone spent you know thousands and thousands of dollars on those things, and their you know their video quality is so much less than the TVs today. Yeah. And it's you can look every you know every year. You know, it's hard to say you know where the economy is going now, but I mean every year they get bigger and they get less expensive for more size. Uh, and you, you know you wonder, and they get thinner, and they, I mean, I mean, it's how far can it go? I mean, it's kind of hard to say. One of the, it's like computer chips; yeah. they're going to continue to you know have different capabilities. The uh, the one thing that I've been that I'm less happy about with the new TVs is that since they're so flat, their their audio is usually is just crap. Uh, but that's that's why we all have uh, sound bars and stuff these days because the, <laughs> they don't have any space yeah. to put in a to put in a speaker. Yeah, this, so they're getting new. They're getting new audio options, yeah. and and uh, you know that's going to come. You know now, you know everybody has some version of like an Amazon Dot or something like yeah. that. You're going to stick it in your sound and uh, through that. And yeah, I you know, I just I do wonder. I mean, I think it's going to continue to develop, and I think it's going to continue to be cool. And, and I, you, but you wonder how programming is going to work. I mean, we've really seen a shift now where there's a lot of reality TV because it's a lot less expensive to produce, and they're figuring out that the margin is better. Even if you were getting you know quality out of uh, other programming, you're you're seeing a different ability to challenge different networks and so that you're seeing a different kinds of shows than you might have seen and all, all that's really cool uh, and so you know where's that you know where's it all going to go in the future i don't know so i do wonder you know what the technology is going to be in 10 years or 15 years and i wonder what the program is going to be in 15 years or, or, or 20 years and, and it's i mean it's it's really looking at the history of television like these two episodes do seeing how quickly it changed at the time seeing how quickly it changes now understanding the history really gives you a lot of uh, interest at least in the future uh, even though I'll probably be one of these, you young whippersnappers, you never knew what it was like to get up to change a channel. Actually, I have you to know, flip uh, the switch. <laughs> have to switch. That's why the reason you had kids, I think maybe we're going to have fewer kids because the reason you had kids is you needed someone to change the channel. For you. Now, <laughs> now we don't need that. Now you, now yeah, you can now, tell your yeah, Amazon. So how, yeah, yeah now, now we have marriages breaking up because it fights over who has the remote control and no reason to have kids. Yeah. You know, and, uh, <laughs> All kids do is lose your remote control. So I don't, I don't, know, don't know what that means for the future of the human race. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Oh, so many things. But I mean, one that I picked up today is I went to watch uh, uh, an episode or a video on Trafalgar. The Battle of Trafalgar has always been really interesting to me. It's called Trafalgar, the Greatest Battle in Naval History. The thing that's interesting from this is that it's told from the story of Pierre Villeneuve, who was the French admiral. Uh, and I never heard Trafalgar told from that side. You know, it's the kind of traditional vision of Trafalgar is that uh, Nelson was a genius when he broke the line and uh, and uh, really understanding you know, how the French and Spanish fleet was there, why they were there, the challenge that he was facing, the politics that he had going on with Napoleon. Uh, in many ways, that battle wasn't supposed to have been fought uh, and how they saw the battle. I mean, it was it's, it's really interesting. I, I would say, I mean, I, I love this very much. It used a very interesting style for uh, documentary and that they were using 3D graphics, but very much like video game sort of graphics. But at times, uh, it was a bit harsh. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this one for kids uh, because they, they they were trying to reasonably accurately show what it was like to be on a French ship while the British were shooting holes in it. So Villeneuve's interesting himself. I mean, honestly, you know, because he... he he died of six stab wounds, and they decided that it was suicide. So, uh, so really, I, I, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> so, I, I still kind of question that conclusion. <laughs> so, it it really, I mean, I I enjoy naval battles. I've read a good amount about Trafalgar, and it's the first time I really heard a really good account from the French side. And it's just one of those great things about Magellan TV. You never know what you're going to run into. What have you been watching lately? So, one of the things I was watching that I thought was really, really quite interesting was they've got. Magellan has this like series of things that are countries from above. And so it's it's essentially a helicopter with a camera going over them. And so one of the ones I watched was Wyoming, Yellowstone National Park. And so it was really cool. So it's part of this section called America from Above the West. They've got lots and lots of different ones where they travel over it. But Yellowstone, I live in Wyoming. And so I've, I've been to Yellowstone a number of times. But this was honestly, I can say it was a different way to look at Yellowstone than I've ever looked at it before. And I saw some stuff that honestly, I hadn't really seen that way before. And so they're just beautiful. It's got some narration which kind of tells you about what's going on with all these people and the history of uh, various things in the park it's a really nice way to if you can't go to yellowstone which of course 
I highly recommend <laughs> if you have the chance. Uh -huh. uh, but it was it was a really cool way to kind of look at something from above and get a view that you don't usually get. Uh, but it's it's really worth watching, and like everything that Magellan does, it's very high quality. It's just very a really nice way to look at something. A whole series of that. They fly over cities. They fly over. So that's uh, you know you never know what you can find on Magellan TV. That's absolutely fascinating to watch. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of the History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash historyguy. Next up, the History Guy tells the story of Don Lee Broadcasting, a different kind of television for a different era. Today, most houses are filled with televisions and devices that have access to all sorts of platforms that produce and stream a mind-numbing amount of content, including the content you're watching today on YouTube. And most of that content today is produced digitally, and it comes into our house through cables or through the internet. But for a long time, most television was broadcast via an antenna, picked up via the airwaves. And inventors like Philo T. Farnsworth and Vladimir Zworkin had developed the technology to be able to do that in the 1920s, but television didn't become popular and wasn't common in households until after the Second World War. But that doesn't mean that nothing happened in between. The big networks that we recognize today, ABC, NBC, and CBS, all formed as radio networks during that period. But one of the lesser-known stories of early broadcast television started in 1926 when a Cadillac dealer bought his first radio station. He had a license to broadcast television in 1931, nearly a decade ahead of the big three. It's history that deserves to be remembered. Don Lee was born in Michigan and made his money by acquiring the exclusive distribution rights for Cadillac cars in California. He used his large personal fortune to purchase the radio station KFRC in San Francisco in 1926 and a year later KHJ in Los Angeles. Lee expanded his radio network across the coast, acquiring stations in Oregon and Washington. A few years later, the Columbia Broadcasting System, or CBS, extended facilities to the coast, and it extended an invitation to Lee's network to broadcast Columbia programming. By 1931, Lee had turned KHJ into the broadcasting hub for his first television station, which broadcast under the call sign W6XS and a sister station W6XAO. He wasn't the very first to start producing television content in America, but the big three didn't start broadcasting television until the eve of the Second World War. He appointed a young engineer named Harry Lubke to run his experimental station, and Lubke became the director of television for the Don Lee Broadcasting System. One of the problems with the television broadcasting network in 1931 was that no one owned a television. It was something of a catch-22. No one would buy a television unless there was something to watch on them, but it was difficult for anyone to produce content when there wasn't anyone to watch. To mitigate this issue, Lubke distributed plans to amateur tinkerers in L.A. for construction of mechanical receiving sets. In 1939, it was estimated that something like 100 people built televisions using Lubke's plans. The station became one of the first to offer regularly scheduled programming on the West Coast when they started broadcasting one hour every day except Sundays. The content was mostly, quote, filmed action and close-ups of movie stars and was broadcast between 6 and 7 in the evening, and they were one of very few stations to continue broadcasting throughout the war. It's largely due to Harry Lubke that the early network was able to transcend from just being an early television network to one that made a mark in television history. Though he would die almost completely unknown, Lubke was a talented engineer and pioneered many television innovations. Like many inventors of the time, Lubke did his own tinkering with the television set. In 1929, he was working with Farnsworth in San Francisco to produce an all-electronic scanning generator system, which was probably one of the more important items in the unprecedented settlement between Farnsworth and RCA in September 1939. RCA purchased a number of Lubke's patents regarding synchronization in 1938. Lubke continued to do work on synchronization, electronic television, and the self-synchronized cathode ray tube. Though many of these patents have become forgotten, the value of his self-synchronizing cathode ray tube was likely the most important. In 1932, Lubke demonstrated television reception on an airplane, largely thanks to his advances in synchronization. According to the Spokane Daily Chronicle on May 23, 1932, Lubke planned to transmit a picture to an airplane cruising about five miles away at an altitude of approximately 6,000 feet. 
The test successfully transmitted a picture of a girl onto the plane from W6XAO. His work led Don Lee to make Lubkey the face of West Coast Television and of W6XAO. W6XAO was one of just six experimental TV stations that existed by 1939. In 1933, it broadcast possibly the earliest television news coverage when they telecast news footage of a Long Beach earthquake to L.A. only a few hours after the event. The station managed to add another first on the very same day when it became the first to broadcast a motion picture, The Crooked Circle, which it broadcast on March 10, 1933. It's believed that the movie was seen by perhaps five L.A. area television receivers. The LA Times Sunday Magazine said in 1936 that W6XAO was the only station that releases regular television broadcasts and one of four centers in the U.S. where serious scientific work on television was being done. But there were big changes on the horizon. In 1934, Don Lee passed away from a heart attack and left his Cadillac business and his broadcasting system to his son, Thomas Lee. The quality of the product that they were producing was increasing over the period for analog television. The quality of the resolution, the, the how good your picture is, depends upon the number of lines that are broadcast. And in 1936, they moved from broadcasting in 80 lines to 300 lines, or a great improvement in the picture resolution. And that was up again to 441 lines in 1938, and 30 frames per second, which was on par with the RCA system. By the outset of the war, they were broadcasting 525 lines. Around 1940, Lee moved the station from 7th and Bixel in L.A. to a new location behind the famous Hollywood sign on top of the hill that is now called Mount Lee. Lubke called it the first structure in the world erected exclusively for telecasting. In 1938, W6XAO broadcast the first American television soap opera when it began airing Vine Street, a 15-minute serial aired twice a week about the difficulties of making it big in Tinseltown. By the next year, four of six nights a week were aired with live talent produced in-house. On January 1st, 1940, the station became the first on the West Coast to transmit a remote broadcast when they broadcast the Tournament of Roses Parade. In 1940, Lubke said that the Lee station was focusing on developing variety shows and that the longest play they had run so far was a 40-minute presentation of Hamlet. By 1940, several different kinds of television were on sale commercially from companies like GE and RCA, and there were hundreds of sets in L.A. to watch the ten and a half hours a week the station broadcast. Most of their time was occupied by films, but they also covered newsreels and their own programming. The broadcast could be picked up at least 22 miles away in Long Beach, where one watcher said he had as many as 30 visitors in one evening to watch. In 1941, W6XAO operated 590 hours and broadcast 67 remote programs. But despite all their innovative television firsts, it wouldn't be a surprise if you've never heard of the Don Lee Broadcasting Network, because while they were busy being pioneers of early television, they were also setting the stage for their own decline. The network wanted to remain an independent network at the time when the larger networks were growing. The network was mostly made up of radio stations across California and in Portland, Seattle, Tacoma, and Spokane. The network's relationship with Columbia fell apart shortly after Don Lee's death in 1934. Friction had been growing between the networks as CBS began demanding more control over its affiliates, especially over programming. In 1936, CBS bought KNX in L.A. and another in San Francisco to replace the need for the Lee Network. Fortunately for Tommy Lee, at the same time that CBS was ridding itself of the Lee Network, the mutual broadcasting system was looking to expand to the West Coast. The switch was scheduled for December 29, 1936, the same day that the CBS contract ended. Even under the new contract, the Lee Network maintained a peculiar independence. Technically speaking, Mutual had only a single affiliate west of the Rockies, the Don Lee Network itself. Mutual had no relationship with the individual stations and provided the network with mutual programs that could then be passed on, but in 1938, only 16 to 20% of the commercial programs on Lee radio stations originated with Mutual. Most of them were still produced by the Lees themselves. What the Lees really wanted was to have an independent regional network that could leverage the resources of a national network, and that worked for the mutual broadcasting system, which had a vision of national reach but local flavor. But unfortunately, that couldn't last. After the end of the war, the consolidation of stations and the growth of the big three would doom a small regional network. Tommy Lee had inherited a $9 million fortune from his father, consisting of the network and his father's car dealerships. He piloted his own plane. He sponsored race cars in Indianapolis. In 1936, he had a personal hot rod design, which he raced on empty lake beds in Southern California. Shortly before World War II, though, he was in a serious accident when he was T-boned by a truck at an intersection. He lived the rest of his life in considerable pain. 
1948, his mental health deteriorated and the courts declared him mentally incompetent. Two years later, the 44-year-old had a driver take him to the dentist in L.A. He went up 12 floors and jumped from the building, leaving his estate to an uncle. Don Lee's radio network and mutual were sold in 1951 to General Teleradio, the broadcasting arms of the General Tire Company. While it maintained the Don Lee logo, the spirit of independence and innovation ended. After a long series of sales where the company lost its logo and its name, the constituent parts were sold to Westinghouse in 1996. Westinghouse owned CBS and merged the radio stations with CBS Radio. It took a long time getting there, but eventually CBS would get control of the Lee Network after all. In 1948, W6XAO stopped being an experimental station and became a fully commercial station under the new call sign KTSL-TV, with the TSL standing for Thomas Lee. And even then, Lubkey and the station continued to innovate. They built a huge antenna and dish that was dubbed the Mountain Shooter in order to broadcast the 1948 Tournament of Roses Parade from Pasadena to Los Angeles. They built the antenna to offset the effects of a 200-foot mountain range, which blocked the transmission, in conjunction with a 9-foot diameter dish in Pasadena. But like the radio stations, the Lee television station wouldn't survive Tommy's death. It was acquired by CBS on January 1st, 1951, and the call letters were changed to KNXT to match the local CBS radio station, KNX. The same station CBS had bought to replace Lee's radio station in 1936. To date exists as KCBS Los Angeles. CBS moved the station off of Mount Lee, and the transmitter that remains is now owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles. Harry Lubke died in 1991, almost completely unknown and largely unrecognized for his technical innovations and his part as a television pioneer. When he died, it was not noted prominently even in local newspapers, and it seems his technical writings and journals were thrown out. His legacy didn't end with his work at the Lee Network, however. He was president of the Television Academy and is credited with coining the name Emmy Award when he suggested Emmy, I-M-M-Y, a term for the image orthicon camera. He co-founded the Society of Television Engineers in 1940 and his later years became a patent lawyer. But for the one-time face of West Coast television broadcasting, few people remember his technical innovations. Today, Lubke and the Lees are largely forgotten. They're relegated to obscure trivia of early television history. Their, their independence streak, while laudable, just didn't have a place in the broadcasting world after the Second World War. And the, the sheer cultural weight and the omnipresence of the large networks and, and large developers like RCA simply overshadowed the technical contributions of a small experimental station that never had more than a few thousand viewers in the LA area. But their independent streak and their technical innovation was important. They took a small experimental station and turned it into a station of early television firsts. And Lubke's contribution to things like tube synchronization materially impacted the future of television. They also had that great commitment to original programming, which was really ahead of its time and presaged the time when families would gather together in the living room for prime time. The golden age of broadcast television simply would not have been the same were it not for the independent streak of the Lee Broadcasting Network. I, I love about this episode is things like, you know, they showed the first movie uh, on TV in the West Coast. And, you know, maybe five people watched it. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, but they kept going. They kept because they knew that this had potential. Yeah. This, it was something that really had to, I mean, it relied on people who were very passionate about it. And yeah. highly technical people. Yeah. Too. Yeah. You literally you gave them a kit and said, build your own TV. <laughs> Go, <laughs> and they did. That's the only way, the only way you're going to have anybody. Uh, the only way you're going to get a TV is if you screw one together yourself. And I mean, that's just hard to imagine. Uh, but, you know, you have, uh, you have people who had those skills and they were interested in it and they started as hobbyists and early adopters and that's what started to make it affordable and started to build programming and uh, you know it's 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 a good story because uh, it, you you kind of wonder how some of these you know how how does Netflix work how does YouTube work how do, I mean how are they going to build how do, if you have a new idea for a new social media how does it build up yeah. well you look at how television did that it was, it's really interesting and it tells you something about where we you know how it might work in the future and where we're going in the future but I mean I, I just this is just a fun episode uh, it really was a fun episode throughout because it's just no one no one remembers them but i mean they were such pioneers and honestly that guy harry lubke uh, he deserves uh, to be remembered as he is really one of the pioneers of television as much as some of the guys that were making the massive technological changes i mean he had his effects on and technology and as the as the head of the of the the 
Television Association. Yeah. But uh, uh, but he also, I mean, he was just, uh, you know, at a time when uh, TV could have just faded because they had nothing to show. I mean, uh, he was one of those guys that really helped to build it. And in some ways, you know, it just seems tragic that it got absorbed in the other networks. And, yeah. uh, all that kind of local, whole idea of local programming and flavor kind of went away. So, I mean, I don't know today. Would it be great if you had the local band playing on the on the TV? It's uh, an it's an interesting that's question. We, that's what it was. Right? That's like, because this it really does represent uh, a very different idea of what you know how television could have developed. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have something more like you had you know local you had programming that was local to certain areas. I mean, that, it kind of would have been interesting on how that would have what kind of visions we mm -hmm. would have seen that you might not have seen when you only had you know a handful of networks. Uh, I, I I don't know. It's it does it does make me wonder though because it it was very different and yeah. I, I wonder what I, I wasn't able to find any of the you know any of the shows that they put on I, I couldn't find any copies of I don't know if someone's got Vine Street uh, somewhere recorded yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah the very first uh, the very first soap opera yeah. Vine Street yeah, yeah I don't know what I don't know what they I don't know what they looked like exactly was, uh, but it was yeah because I mean, these were I mean they weren't the first television broadcasters yeah. in the world or even in the U.S. but they were among the first and they were certainly one of the first on the West Coast and they and they really were pioneering and yeah what is that what is that like? I mean, does anybody even have scripts of Old Vine Street or remember it at all? Because that's truly a bit of television yeah. history. And, uh, you know, ended up being now, you know, I don't know how many people, but, you know, how many millions of people have watched daytime television, yeah. daytime drama. And, and they were, they were, they were started right out with those 15 minute that. serials. Well, yeah. and it's, it's funny to, to look at it because, you know, we talked about how some of these people that very highly technical to do it. And yet the guy who, you know, really kind of got it started, the, the money. Don Lee there was a uh -huh. Cadillac dealer. Yeah, he's a car salesman. Yeah, <laughs> he's, yeah totally. He's just, he's just like, oh, this like, it looks like there's something in the future here. But he was clearly yeah, he willing to, to invest and, and, well, and hire the right people because I think that that's what you could say about Harry Luke, is that That's he, right. He didn't have to. I mean, yeah, he uh, – so Don Lee did not feel like he had to try to micromanage yeah. everything. But he, he caught the vision and his money made it all happen. And it, it is funny to think that this network, which ended up being you know so important to the building of the popularity of television, was – was run by this this car salesman. It's tragic what happened to his son in the end, and you know it's uh, it's a really an interesting story. There, I mean, their family, you know, that's all an interesting story too. You get those little dynasties that appear, and they and they really do make a difference. And you see them in politics or business or whatever. So they're, I mean, they the the Lees deserve to be remembered because that Don Lee system, I mean, it not only represented early television, but it represented the 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 alternative to the model that we wound up with. So you can get a vision of how it could have happened yeah. uh, had it happened differently. Uh, and they resisted, uh, you know, the the monoliths for a very long time, and that you know you've got to appreciate them. Yeah, for even that. for a while there, uh, they they kind of beat CBS when they were able to to uh, group with the mutual broadcasting system and everything, and they were mm -hmm. able to have at least for a, a longer than most. I, I mean, I'm not sure about that. I, mean, I know there were other networks like this. I don't know them as well. Uh, but they they really yeah. were able to survive into a period, and I wonder, you know, yeah, what one of the lines like going on yeah. for people who were able to listen to that. I just I kind of wonder what that was, uh, and I, some of the people in the comments talked about that, or that they've they've listened to like radio programs that will mention the the Don Lee Broadcasting Network, and I think that's really an interesting, uh, and it's all just so different mm -hmm. from what we do today. But they also, you know, Don Lee was only throwing that out to just his his little section. So I don't think that was, he was borrowing mm -hmm. stuff from CBS. But... Yeah, it was, it was only ever regional, yeah. but he wanted it to be regional. Yeah. And the, uh, so the idea that you had a regional station that purchased some of its programming from the larger station and stuff like that, it still had a lot of local programming. That's, you know, it's kind of a model that we don't really use no. anymore. And because of that, you know, do you have, I mean, we're, uh, newspapers going that way. We're losing local newspapers yeah. and, 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 you know, I, you know, I, history's history. Things move the way they move, but I mean, it is, it is okay to be nostalgic for some of that and to wonder, you know, what that kind of might have been like uh, and how fun it must have been to try to be one of the early TV personalities, yeah. people that were transitioning from radio to television. Cause of course, Donnelly started out as a radio yeah. network, but I mean the, the people that were, you know, popular on both and what those shows were like and what it was like to try to, uh, you know, really embrace this new medium. I mean, it's just, it was, it's an exciting time. And uh, these guys were, uh, you know, they just kept their vision together for a very long time, and that's and that's extraordinary. So it's you know, it's it's tragic that like Lubke's papers were essentially lost, yeah. and he became kind of forgotten and lost to history. I mean, if for no other reason than he's the guy that coined the term Emmy Award. Yeah, that's which uh, I and which, that was such a, that's such an interesting part of the story that 
Uh, and yeah. no, I mean, I'd never heard anyone. I had never really considered what what a uh, coin yeah, coins that how, term. What, why know. why it's named Emmy Award? Yeah, and uh, that, so it's it's all around. It's just a, it's a fascinating story. I love how these two episodes really complementary complement yeah. each other because you can talk broadly about how television was developed, but all along the way, there's all these incremental changes in both technology, but also in programming. As you have that challenge that you know, without programming, then no one wants to buy the technology. Without the technology, yeah. no one wants to make programming. How these guys were threading those needles, and you know, it just it's cool. This Someone decided, you know, the Rose Parade is perfect for television. And even if only 50 people watch it the first gonna, year, gonna... you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up and up and up and up and up. Although though I have to say, you know, from what we move, if you want an inside uh, view of the history guy, we use uh, we use things in the public domain. It's hard to get pictures of the Rose Parade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stunningly difficult to find pictures of a Rose Parade from a particular year that were in the public yeah, this, domain. Uh, this so, is I mean, one you know, of those episodes. If you notice, yeah, these are, that fits yeah, these right pictures the... of the Rose Parade are completely different yeah. years. That was just, that was, someone was nice enough to put that picture of that float in the public domain and we used it. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's but I mean that these guys saw that that vision for it, and then they had to you know they had to look over the mountain, and so they bought the top of the mountain, and, and the top of the mountain there is still the the receiver still up there, it's run by the city now. Yeah, that's uh, but that was so that they could broadcast, you know, that they could see this it's a signal up from the from the road. Yeah, parade. They, well, they, it's all it's just it's just they were very. It seems like it was almost a cowboyish the way that they came up with solutions to yeah. to figure out how to you know shoot. They they build the the big antenna to get it over to Pasadena. And <laughs> I'd say it was uh -huh. really some interesting, some just really interesting stuff. And it is. And, and you know, they were, I mean, the first, the, the, you know, the, the first soap opera, yeah. the first live news broadcast, uh, the first, I mean, they, these, uh, the first time a movie was played on yeah. television. I mean, they really did some first that are, you know, become, you know, big parts of TV. Uh, and so, I mean, these, you know, there's the, these guys, uh, uh, Love Key and Lee, they both deserve to be remembered. They really do that. This, this medium that changes all so much that has now, you know, transformed itself so much i mean those guys uh, they were really pioneers of it in really extraordinary ways and it's it's great how they found some of the solutions yeah. they they really deserve to be remembered it's uh this this episode i wrote it but it, one of the interesting things about it is that this this actually began as a paper i wrote in college in probably 2013 something like that uh and so i had had it sitting around and then i started writing for the history guy but if you if you thought that I wasn't going to look into like like this is this is who my dad raised is that in college I was already <laughs> looking at obscure historical stories to 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 write about and I, I really enjoyed the story and then at some point as I was writing episodes I was like huh you know this one actually might make a really good episode and that and I just had you know I already had all the the research and stuff so and it, and it worked out pretty well and it, it's just such an interesting uh, story but I, I think that. I think that that's a. I, I was always this way. This is not something I, uh, <laughs> I. If you're raised in the history guy household, I think you just you come to appreciate history in a particular way and like yeah. those those storytelling and unique yeah. stories. Um, uh, I'm I'm so proud. Uh, it's great that that I worked with. Well, I guess I now I'm working with both of you because your brother's involved in the channel yeah. too, uh, and uh, you know, you know. I got a lot from my dad, and uh, and you know we, that we carried on. It's a great voice for us to be able to do that. So you can certainly tell that there's a, a lot of interests uh, that are similar that yeah. you know, grew up with time. And uh, this is you know we both say that uh, there's nothing more fun than when you find one that's not in Wikipedia. Yeah, that's the... uh, and then, you know you found something really. And if you can get enough research to produce that there, then you know you feel like you're ahead of the world. And I, I love I love when people give comments saying I never heard of this, I had no idea. And this is one of those uh, that we had. Yeah, yeah, this one I I uh, I did learn about it because I've seen people who are like oh, i even took communication classes they didn't teach me about this and so I, I did learn about it in a in a history of american communication class uh but i did it on my own this was like we had a, the, the last paper was a go find something related to american communication and write it so they they did not teach it to me so much as offer me the opportunity mm -hmm. to go learn it <laughs> but yeah and if you what i know by the way that 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 school of communication that josh was at the same one where i did my master's yeah. degree so we we both went to the same school there uh and uh, so we we have that background too uh and yeah it's you're, you're right even in if you did history of communicate you did history of television you might not get yeah. to the donley broadcasting system and yet when you get there you find out that there's it's yeah. really interesting and there's a lot to learn there and that they really do deserve to be remembered it's one of the things that i think we kind of learned in in the in listening to both of these episodes is that when you when it, when i remember when i was learning about it in like the the 101 course where they're just giving you the the broad history of like mass media uh the the history of television is not as simple as you know they kind of they kind of paint it to be and even then it's not like it's simple because like you said there's all these different people who come in with zorkin and farnsworth and who who all should be responsible for it but when you look at it you know on the mm -hmm. ground like like don lee shows is that there were a lot of people 
uh, who were doing things all over the place. And the fact that, you know, Loki yeah. was working on a very specific when he was doing the, the frequency stuff that he was, he was working on something very, very specific, but that was important. And there are lots yeah. of other people like that. And it's, it's interesting to, mm -hmm. I, I think it's cool to take a, a deep dive into that and kind of learn some of this stuff that, Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of names yeah. other, you know, outside of the Donnelly system, oh, yeah. the Donnelly system is a good way to see it, you know, what, how it looked like in its early stages and uh, the, how that model kind of developed over time, but also how these just people that were on the ground were solving the problems that had to be solved. Uh, and that eventually would, you know, allow that to point. I mean, imagine at one point we couldn't figure out how to broadcast from Pasadena up to Los yeah. Angeles. And now, you know, we're, we're live streaming around the world. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, they, they all work together to make that happen. Yeah. It's incredible. And it's, it's, it's just amazing how we were able to put all this together and still have it be what it is today. And that it kind of formed such a, so, ad hoc you know that people had visions but they were all different visions but i was also thinking about the fact that this was one of the only tv stations and radio stations that was really being uh experimental that was record was playing stuff during the war and they continued to mm -hmm. mo almost all television development as you mentioned in the first episode stopped during the war yeah. uh they we were putting yeah yeah essentially into, they yeah they... Uh, yeah yeah, it all went into war production. You couldn't build, you couldn't build a TV set because we were too busy building radio. And yet they were they were airing some stuff throughout the war. And I think that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting step to see that even when you know we had big national things going on, there was still so uh, there were still people who were really interested in this and still interested in what it could become. Well, I, mean, I understand the meaning of that because I mentioned how what the demand for news was yeah. during the war. So I, I I recall when the Gulf War started and and there were guys from CNN that were in the hotel there in Baghdad, and that was the first time we had really heard real time a war starting. So now, I mean, you can go on and see videos all the time of what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, even though we're starting, I'm always confused about what's going on in Ukraine, but I mean, you can actually see, you know, battles being fought, people taking pictures of these with their drones and they're live yeah. streaming this and it's, stuff. It's incredible. It's kind of some new issues uh, on so, whether you can believe what you're saying or, but, but yeah, I mean, there's constantly, true, there's yeah. constantly Ch shots of changes the whole thing. things exploding. And yeah, stuff. but I mean, you know, now, now we're seeing, you know, essentially kind of war in real time, including even maybe the fog of war. Uh, where at the time, you know, you know, could you even broadcast yeah. your, you know, your soap opera I mean, during the war? N nowadays, so I, we've got it's, the, it's, again, all the maps that are tracking every single day what's going on in this war. I mean, this that's there's almost been nothing like that. Uh, in the, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so, I mean, you can see how far that's come and, and you know, what that means. That, that, but the, it is true uh, that it, TV came out before the war. It, it really didn't become popular until after the war. And that development during the war, it's incredible that that occurred because the war was yeah. going on. Uh, and and that you know made a difference so that when those GIs came home and they had you know they had some money in their pockets then uh, this could really grow, and th there's just the, you know the enormous amount of change that came in the post-war world, uh, you know, industrialization and things like that. I mean uh, uh, the episode that we put up on the on the channel this morning is about bologna. I mean bologna changed yeah. because uh, because convenience food changed because the same technology changes that were coming in that period it was such a an interesting time of development and these guys were you know when no one else was doing it they were they hung on and they continued doing it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.